professor of agronomy <coughs> at the Division of Plant Soil Sciences here at West Virginia University. And he's involved in research and teaching in forage and grassland management. And also teaches a course in field crops and cropping systems. His past research focused on the effects of winter and early spring grazing intensity and timing on total season pasture productivity. He's presently evaluating pasture defoliation management impacts on root density. And part of his research involves measurement of near infrared light reflectance as part of a, a way to assess root concentration, pasture soils, and species composition in pasture canopies. So his topic here, as you see, is grazing management strategies with cattle. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Riggs. Thanks. <coughs> I'm sorry, is that too loud? I better, can we, can we adjust this at all? It's fine. OK, great. Um, I was. Uh, confused in, in the next room waiting to, to speak and then someone else started setting up and I was wondering if she was maybe I'm in the wrong room so I apologize if I gave anyone a start. Um, thanks for being here. I, I really appreciate this audience because you're all interested and it's so nice to, to speak to people who are interested. Um, I was given, this is an extremely broad topic and so I tried to Think about it in ways that uh, I, I, I put some boundaries on this and, and tried to, to kind of tailor it so that it's relevant to what I think most of us in the room would be working with or dealing with. So if you feel like there's something I left off or, or forgot to include, bring it up. And, and please, my, my vision isn't all that great unless I wear my glasses, but I'm too lazy to wear them. So, uh, move your hand around uh, or speak up. If you've got questions as we go, I'm happy to have you just pipe up as we go. Uh, I'll try to leave room also at the end. But um, So the, the way, a couple ways I approach this. Um, there happened to be, just a little bit more introduction here before I start, there happened to be two or three new uh, publications, one of which is a very producer-friendly, producer-oriented publication by Daryl Amick, who used to be NRCS New York. Some of you might know Daryl. Um, he was working for University of Vermont Extension for a while, and he put out about a 90-page guide to pasture grazing, and I think he calls it Pasture as a Crop. And I want to refer to that once or twice, get you oriented to it, in case any of you want to go online and find it. It's, it's really well written. It's a nice summary. The other one I want to that I kind of based some of, uh, of the, the focus of this talk on is there's been a multi-year, multi-agency, USDA, NRCS, American Foraging Grassland Council, Land Grant University effort to evaluate the science behind the NRCS prescribed grazing conservation practice. And uh, one of the things that happened is the publication, it's, it's, well, actually, I've got it here. I'd be happy to have any of you look at it after the talk. It's called Conservation Outcomes from Pasture Land and Hayland Practices. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, but one of the chapters in here is an extremely in-depth, extensive chapter that evaluates the, the, the current scientific basis research basis for grazing management practices and methods. And um, the, the, the people that wrote this chapter spent about four years summarizing the research literature. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, but I, I, I wanted to give you a couple of high points from this publication. It just came out two months ago. So with that background, let's get started. We got the word strategy in the title. That was assigned to me. So I always want to know, well, you know, strategy to do what? To accomplish what? What's, what's, what's the purpose that I'm creating a strategy for? So uh, I want us just to think about strategies to me. I'm not going to get bogged down with definitions. But to me, strategies are simply plans or approaches <coughs> and actions that I'm going to take to accomplish something some goal, some objective. Um, and so the question, of course, then is, well, what's supposed to be happening? I've got a, a forage livestock system. I've got a pasture system. Uh, what's supposed to be happening? Do I just let it run itself? Do I copy what the neighbors do? Do I follow land? 
Rand Grant University and extension agent recommendations. How do I find my way through all this? And so I think uh, it's really important. A lot of us have challenges and trouble actually defining our goals, our objectives, or we get a little bit lazy. I, I include myself in that uh, group. And hardly any of us ever write this stuff down to the point where we can show someone written goals or objectives that we are trying to accomplish with our operations. But it's really important. And I want to lead you through just my thought process if I was charged with coming up with strategies for how to graze cattle, my place, my conditions, to suit my goals. Um, so I want to talk, as the next element in this talk, I want to talk about some of the challenges we have that we have to design strategies for. And one of the biggest challenges, of course, we all face with pastures, this part of the country, this part of the world, is we have this seasonal growth distribution that's not uniform. It's, it's high in the spring, moderate in the summer, and of course we have dormant uh, growing conditions in the winter. So how do we deal with that, particularly if we've got year-round animals or a cow-calf herd where we can't just make the animals go away? We can make the animals go away in many cases if we've got a stalker operation. So there's the, you know, talk about strategies. That's one of the things we can talk about is whether to make the animals go away. Um, I want to talk about maintaining and improving the solar panel that we are all manipulating and uh, managing as we capture sunlight energy and turn it into plant tissue that we feed through animals to, to, to make some sort of uh, effective product and, 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 and income. So I want to talk about the, the solar capture part of forage management. Uh, plant energy balance is part of that. Plant animal relationships and optimum intensity of production. I'll come back to that in a little bit. That, that comes straight out of that um, this publication that was uh, pointed out as probably being the number one factor we need to focus on in pasture management based on the research literature findings. Uh, concepts and methods of allocating forage to animals over the season over the year. So that's where we'll talk about a few actual grazing uh, management methods. <clears throat> so, back to the question. We might have sheep, cattle, goats, uh, wildlife that we're interested in, some aspect of their performance, uh, economic returns from them, uh, personal lifestyle rewards, whatever they are, we need to be very clear about what are our goals, our objectives, our targets. Uh, I often think when I'm, if, if I'm concerned with certain class of animals out there on the landscape, first thing I want to know about them is what's their individual animal performance target? Are they, is this a class that needs to be gaining at a moderate rate, at a high rate, or is this a class of livestock that I can keep at a maintenance level or even allow them to, uh, to lose weight? Maybe they were built up to a higher body condition than they need to be, and I can actually peel some of that weight off, and that gives me all kinds of flexibility, but I need to know that. What's supposed to be happening to this group of animals? And then I can make decisions about, well, what's the corresponding forage need to be and how do I need to manage it? So we've got these trade-offs, and I think you all know this. We can have high individual animal performance, high average daily gain, but it's going to be at lower stocking rate than if we had high stocking rate, high carrying uh, carrying a high number of animals, they're going to be more towards a maintenance level of condition. So we have to make these choices. And if you start getting into the economics of all this, which we will in a bit, you find it's really important where you are in, in all those trade-offs. Not everything happens successfully at the same stocking rate. So you know these publications I want to bring to your attention. The first one by Daryl Emick. He's retired now, but he was uh, a grassland specialist with New York uh, NRCS for many years. Managing Pasture as a Crop, a guide to good grazing. It's really well written. Uh, you can get it from the University of Vermont Extension. I gave you the link here. Come and see me later if, if I didn't give you enough time to write it down. Here's the next one. Um, and I know it, it, uh, you might wonder, well, how come Ms. Griggs is, is talking about something from Nebraska and Seminary and things like that? Here's a publication relatively recent, integrating management objectives and grazing strategies on semi-arid rangeland. Well, ignore the semi-arid rangeland part. 
virtually all of what's in this. This is a nice extension publication, very readable. Virtually everything in there applies to West Virginia and, and the kinds of uh, uh, thinking and decision making we need to do. It's, it's a very well written publication. Um, here's the next one. I'm not going to talk much about it, but if anyone is looking for just a, a, a short two or three page paper you can give someone else if you're trying to convince them about the importance of grassland agriculture, well managed grazing systems, a forgotten hero of conservation. It's in a recent journal of soil and water conservation, some of you probably get that magazine, um, and does a really nice job of spelling out how pasture and grazing systems contribute to sustainability of agriculture, soil and water conservation, um, uh, economic returns from marginal land. It, it paints a really complete picture that many people don't have. Here's the last one, this, this bulletin I held up, Conservation Outcomes from Pasture Land and Human Land Practices, Assessment Recommendations and Knowledge Gaps. And so I'll, I'm going to go just a little bit into the recommendations. This is all available online. Daryl Emick, pasture is a problem. He's got an interesting definition of what he calls a functional pasture. What, what's it take for a pasture to be functional? Land with suitable amount, type, and distribution of vegetation that when utilized with a sufficient level of management complements or meets nutritional requirements of livestock for as long a time period as possible. So ideally for the entire year are right. Unlike conserved feeds, harvested forages, it is utilized while actively growing, so it's, it's, a, it's a living resource that's kind of different from a harvested crop, so it's continually changing yield, quality, composition, a lot of the things we talked about yesterday. So that makes it challenging, obviously, because it doesn't stay the same. More difficult to master than many other crops, because it is a living resource, it involves integrating and managing forage production, with livestock production, and then making these decisions about, well, how much of that forage do I allocate to the animals, the utilization level, and all those choices in the same time and space. If you go to the Nebraska bullet I mentioned by Pat Reese and, and colleagues, they talk about the importance of setting goals, establishing clear objectives so you can decide when where and how much forage to graze. And it should be based on clearly defined animal production objectives, resource management objectives, and economic objectives. Obviously, we don't want to lose track of the economic returns part of sustainability. And they, they talk about a grazing strategy. If you look at this, this diagram of all the interacting factors, pasture objectives, plant resources you have to work with, uh, livestock management issues, production objectives um, that, that all kind of point to grazing strategies that you then apply to your system in terms of stocking rates and, and dates that you do your operation and seasons. They talk about grazing strategy being basically a plan for accomplishing objectives based on comprehensive knowledge of your resources, the production and marketing environment. That's a pretty nice summary. And I think most of us are thinking along these lines, but it never hurts to formalize things another notch up and actually get some of this down on paper. Okay, let's go to this CEAP publication, uh, and specifically chapter three, which is called Prescribed Grazing on Pasture Land. So this pertained to the eastern half of the US, not the western lands. And what the authors summarized in this extensive chapter is, uh, I've already explained this, this who they were. They, basically, the one thing they pointed to, the overarching important feature of pasture and grazing management that we need to pay the most attention to is grazing intensity. What's intensity? It's either stocking rate, if you want to think about it from the animal side, or if you want to think about it from the plant side, Pasture mass, pasture height, or light interception, the solar panel we're trying to, to manage. Grazing intensity, so in other words, the amount of forage 
which that's being removed and the frequency it's being removed with, that's grazing intensity, is the prescribed grazing strategy that has the greatest impact on plants, animals, soils, water, and wildlife. So that's the one thing we can focus on if we're talking about strategies as a starting point. And then we can add others later. Defining and achieving an optimal grazing intensity, this is their language, should be of highest priority in conservation planning and implementation. So I'm going to talk about, well, how do we, what's that mean? What's an optimal grazing intensity mean? We'll talk, we'll talk about that. It's these trade-offs of animal performance versus game free. Stocking method. So this has to do with, are we talking about continuous grazing, rotational grazing, creek grazing, these various other um, spe specific techniques or procedures. Stocking method is useful for fine tuning the system once appropriate grazing intensity is imposed, but they keep coming back to, this is actually more important than this, the, the actual grazing method. Rotational versus continuous stocking positively <coughs> affects forage accumulation and utilization as well as quality, and we'll look at those kinds of uh, results. Terms and concepts, just a few more. I don't want to get bogged down with this stuff. Prescribed grazing, NRCS uses the term just to mean managing the harvest of vegetation with grazing and or browsing animals to achieve specific objectives. Principles of grazing management that we're talking about here today and throughout this whole conference basically revolve around or center around distribution of various kinds and numbers of livestock in time and space. That's all grazing management is. Grazing intensity, back to this term that they coined, animal-based or pasture-based measurements that tell us something about the degree or severity of use and the frequency of use of pasture plants. So we can think about it in terms of it being stocking rate or forage mass. And the canopy height, by the way, could be during grazing <coughs> a continuously grazed system. We want to pay attention to what is it right now today. Uh, or if it's rotational stocking, we can talk about before grazing and after grazing. And then there's white interception that we'll get into. Uh, if we combine pasture and animal measurements together to get at grazing intensity, we're using terms like grazing pressure or forage allowance, all those mean our grazing pressure is, certain, is simply the number of animals that are competing for a given amount of forage on an acre. Let's say today the pasture we're all standing in has 2,500 pounds of ground matter per acre in it of soil surface, okay? So grazing <coughs> pressure is higher if you've got 20 animals competing for that forage than if you've got 10. That's all grazing pressure is. It has nothing to do with land area. It's, it's, it's ratioed directly to the amount of forage that happens to be on that land. Forage allowance is the, uh, is the other way around. It's how much forage, dry matter, are you assigning to an individual animal in a day? It's somewhat like what Gene Felton was talking about yesterday afternoon. I'm going to assign this particular animal 30 pounds of pasture dry matter today, or 20 or 40 based on their requirements. So that's what forage allowance is. Grazing systems and methods. Um, and then we're going to move on to specific uh, information about all this stuff. System, grazing system. It's just an integrated combination of soils, plants, animals, social and economic features, stocking methods, which are much more highly specific, and management objectives to achieve specific Highly individualized, every one of us here is probably going to come up with a slightly or even dramatically different grazing system, even though we might all be trying to accomplish the same objectives. Ranging from more intensively to extensively managed. Stocking method, <coughs> method, the system method is much simpler, much easier to get your, your, your mind around. It's just a part of a grazing system. A stocking method is just a way to manipulate animals in space and time achieve specific objectives. So it's a way to assign forage to animals. Several methods are often combined within a season. So we might have continuous stocking mm -hmm. in late, mid, or early spring. We might go to rotational stocking during uh, late spring and summer. We might 
throw in mechanical hay harvesting as the, part of that process. We might have strip grazing during the winter when we've got dormant forage and we're not going to intend to ever come back to it until it grows again. Method can be overemphasized. There's an awful lot of interesting articles and debates in, and arguments in the, the, the farm magazines, the, the, the research literature on, you know, does it matter whether we're using this method or that method? Um, and I, I'm afraid we overemphasize methods uh, to, to some extent instead of paying attention to monitoring, forage budgeting, marketing, natural resource enhancement, which are probably more important in my opinion. One of the things that I, probably any number of you already do, and, and those of you that don't already will now be able to do with your, your pasture sticks, a lot of people go out and, and, and actually have a fairly close <coughs> um, mental uh, picture of how much forage they have on their farm today or this week, and how much they're likely to have two and three weeks from now. Uh, just based on routine measurements of pasture sticks. And so we'll talk more about that as well. Okay, so if someone asks me to think about strategies and come up with a list of strategies, first thing I'm going to think about is, well, targets. What am I trying to achieve? So here is just a laundry list of targets that I feel like I have to deal with when I'm managing the pasture. Um, and I'm going to tailor my management to, to, to hit the targets. Uh, do I want to maximize economic return? Do I want to maximize environmental return? Maybe soil and water conservation and wildlife habitat improvement? Yes. My answer is yes. Do I want to match forage resources with livestock demand? My answer is yes. Do I want to, mi want to minimize not only hay feeding, but I want to minimize hay making as well, just to save time and cost? Yes. Uh, do I sometimes need to change feed supply and or demand as I go through all the variations in pasture growth rate across a, a, a year? Yes, I need to do that. Uh, do I want a late summer stockpile materials so I can graze it in the winter? Yes, I do, uh, because I can cut down on hay feeding and feeding. Um, do I have targets for spring and summer grazing management so that when I get to late summer, I can actually, I actually have the potential or the capacity to do some stockpiling. Uh, I think a lot of the time we get so focused on utilizing our pasture resources, what we think of as efficiently during the growing season, that by the time we get to mid and late August, we've hit the pasture so hard they don't have much capacity to regrow during August, September, October. And so even though we would like to stockpile material for fall and winter grazing, Pastures don't respond because we hit them too hard all spring and summer. Uh, maintain or improve botanical composition. Sometimes I'm going to be concerned um, if I've got too little legume. I, I want to increase the legume in my pastures, but by the same token, um, I got into situations with some of our research pastures at, at Reedsville where we've had dramatic shifts and we've, we've got too much legume. We've got too much white red clovers in our pastures now. And they've dangerous. So how do I switch that back, get more grass in there? Uh, and part of the reason I want to do that is uh, I want to minimize load um, and, and other health risks. Okay, so this is out of Daryl Emick's publication, The Pasture is a Crop, and you're all familiar with this. If you look at the distribution of pasture dry matter yield over the growing season, uh, April through late October, uh, Daryl is trying to point out here, and this is just two different years, so this is yield on the on vertical axis, and uh, the maximum number is up here around 1,600 pounds of dry matter per acre. Uh, it's because it's being grazed. If you were raising this as a hay crop, those numbers would be a lot higher. But Daryl's point is, we get about 50% of our annual total growing season forage dry matter production in this period of the first two, two and a half months. That's about 50% of our supply that we have to work with. The other 50% occurs here over the remaining three and a half to four months. So I think that's just a useful way of breaking out, okay, I need to make some, some, some allocation decisions 
about how do I keep up with this faster growing forage and utilize it effectively in the spring without being stocked so heavily that now I'm going to over be overstocked and overutilize this forage in the summer. How do I do that? Well, what's one strategy that probably most of us use? Let's, let's say we're not going to change animal numbers. Let's say we kind of base our animal numbers on getting through the summer slump, the, the late summer period. How do we deal with the surplus, most of us? <coughs> yeah, we cut and make hay, okay? Excellent strategy. Makes a lot of sense. Um, so let's go on now. If you think about, okay, so that's the, the picture for the whole season. Now let's think about within an individual growth cycle or an individual hay cutting, uh, individual regrowth, following grazing. Let's think about what we call these phases, and some of you are familiar with these terms, phases one, two, and three of pasture growth, either coming out of winter into spring, or pasture regrowth after plants been uh, grazed off. Let's think about, this is, this is forage mass on the side, percent of maximum, so I'm just gonna call this 100%. That might be 2,000 or 2,300, 2,500 pounds. Forage dry matter per acre would be a maximum in a well-managed pasture, maybe 3,000. So these are just percentages of that. <laughs> As we're coming out uh, of, of uh, the, the, the previous grazing, down in what's called phase one. We've got short material, doesn't have much leaf area, so it doesn't have the solar panel capture characteristics because it's mostly stem and maybe a few leaves that are still there are brown, so they're not going to be effective at capturing sunlight energy and turning it into to plant tissue. So we call that phase one, and obviously growth rate is going to be very low or zero when plants are in phase one. So we don't really want our plants to be in phase one much, if at all, of the growing season because we're wasting sunlight energy. It's falling on material that can't capture sunlight energy effectively. Phase two is this rapid growth phase where plants have enough leaf area that they're capturing virtually all the sunlight energy that's falling on that land area, that square foot, turning it into plant tissue. But then we finally get to phase three, where even if we could utilize that mature, stemmy, coarse forage, maybe, that, maybe we have a fit for that. Uh, the problem with phase three is, look at this, the pasture growth rate flattened out. Even though there's a lot of forage there, the daily growth rate is very low. Part of the reason for that is there's so much leaf area up here that basal leaves are shaded and not enough sunlight is getting down to the base and so all we've done is elevated these growing green leaves up to the top of the canopy and the bottom of the canopy is falling apart and we're wasting the ability to capture sunlight energy. So we just assume not be in phase three and it's certainly low quality forage of course it's hay stage forage it's not pasture stage. We really like to spend as much of the grazing season as possible in phase two. What's phase two look like? Rotational grazing system, pretty easy to maintain pastures in phase two. So rotational stocking example for most pool season species, orchard grass, tall fescue, smooth grown, timothy, Kentucky grass. Phase two is between about four and 10 inches in, in height. You've heard these kinds of numbers before. So that's what we're gonna be moving into next is that four to 10 inches in height. That actually looks more like 12 inches to me. Um, but you'll notice, we still have a fair bit of forage here. The animals have been here for one, two, three days. We're not gonna graze that down to phase one. We're gonna try to leave it at the lower end of phase two when we move in here so that this can immediately start capturing sunlight and regrowing. Does that make sense? So there it is, uh, 12 inches pre-graze, three or four inch post-graze is our target. Back to strategies. I'm going to leave three to four inches so there's enough leaf area to be an effective solar panel. Uh, if we go to some of the finer bladed grasses, some of the, the you know the red fescues and, and uh, uh, Kentucky bluegrass that actually fall in there, uh, phase two is between two and six inches in height. So it's not just a strict height; it's 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 a leaf area kind of a, a property. Um, now let's talk about. What's phase three look like? Does this look familiar to any of us? How many of us are challenged with this kind of a condition in June? Spring? 
spite of our best efforts, in spite of our, you know, all the reading and studying and, and writing things down, how many of us get into this in June? We're awash in a sea of surplus forage, and it's beyond pay stage. It wouldn't even make good hay. It got away from us. It happens every year to me, at least. Um, that's just an example of what we'd like to avoid if we could. Sometimes we have to, to deal with it. Um, We'd also like to avoid, though, this phase one. What are, who is gaining from, from this condition? Are the animals gaining anything from phase one forage? The quality is there, but what about the bites? They're not getting enough dry matter intake. They're, they're, they're scavenging, they're struggling, they're showing ribs, they're not getting the intake they need. What about the pasture? Is the pasture benefiting from being in phase one? probably a negative energy balance. The roots are probably starting to, 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 to be pruned off and disappear, so it's not getting the water and nutrient uptake that it should because it's stressed. It doesn't have enough leaf area to maintain the root system below ground. So what could we do differently here? Let's say we agree that's not good for the animals or the pasture. What could we do differently? What are some options, some strategies that we could at least consider? Maybe they're not practical, but we could at least put them on the list. Less animals. Less animals. Move them sooner. Move them sooner. To what? What are we going to move them to? What if the whole farm looks like this? <laughs> Feed them hay. Possibly use fertilizer. Possibly, I'm amazed uh, as I learn more and more about people that irrigate in the eastern half of the U.S. I can't believe how much irrigation I'm discovering. You irrigate. Does anyone in this room irrigate? I've, I've had a number of students in my classes who come from West Virginia farms that have center pivots. I had no idea that that was going on in this part of the country. Uh, so there are things you can do to change the picture, either from the animal side or the plant side. Might get some clover to come in there. Might get some clover to come in there and we can ramp your productivity up 20 or 30 percent. Very good. Uh, here's what's going on in those plants that are in phase one being pushed hard so they don't have enough leaf area to generate energy to send down the root <coughs> system. So guess who falls away and dies back? The tops survive, but the roots don't. So look at the, the, the way we just compromise pasture productivity. We might have a good, fertile, well-watered soil, but the roots aren't capturing any of that because there are no roots there. So we can go from this condition to this condition to this condition very, very easily through improving the timing and severity. So that's the intensity of, of defoliation. Um, we never see this, and so we don't really know what's going on. We, we tend to ignore it, but it's, it's, uh, it's a lot more important than many of us realize. Now, I want to talk just briefly about light capture. Again, if you think about a growth curve, Here's phase one, here's phase two, here's phase three. Just we're looking at it in slightly different terms. One of the things you find out if you graph as, as, as we go through increasing time of regrowth, if you graph the percentage of sunlight energy that's hitting that canopy and being absorbed by green leaves, you find pasture growth rate is highest. So this is pasture growth rate right here highest when the canopy is intercepting about 95% of the total sunlight that's falling on it, okay? Once you start capturing 100% of sunlight energy, which I think intuitively you might think is what we want to do, you start to get so much shading from these tall canopies that the bottom starts turning brown and dying and falling back and coming apart. And we've still got to bear the cost for that living tissue uh, requiring energy. That's called respiration. So the plants are burning up sugars from photosynthesis, but the photosynthesis is happening farther up in the canopy, and so we're wasting an awful lot of plant energy. And we've got all this death and decomposition. And so net accumulation of dry matter happens at about 95% light intensity or light interception. Well, what's that, what's that really mean in terms of pasture management? If you were to take, here's a way to think about it, and I'll pass this around. There's a concept called leaf area index. And all it is is it's the area of leaves, one side of a leaf, 
that land area they're growing on. So let's take, I'm going to pretend this is a square foot. Uh, I think it's two thirds of a square foot. So eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. It's about two thirds of a square foot. Okay? Now, I'm going to cut that piece of paper into four fake leaves. Okay? It's just, I uh, just cut the, the paper into four strips. And I'm going to call those four strips, they're also two thirds of a square foot. I'm going to call those a plant. So now I've got a plant, and one side of each leaf is capturing sunlight energy. They're green leaves, and they're converting that into sugars and fiber. And that one plant is growing on, so one unit of plant leaf area is growing on one unit of land area. Does that make sense? That's what leaf area index is. That means one unit of leaf area per one unit of plant, uh, I'm sorry, one unit of land area, you call that a leaf area index of one. One unit of leaf area, one unit of land area. Now, what if I added a second such plant and a third such plant to that same square foot of land area. What's my leaf area index now? I've got three of these plants on the same square foot. Three, okay? So when you see numbers that relate to leaf area index, that's all it means. And what we found over the years is if you got horizontally oriented leaves like clovers, they're kind of flattish to the incoming sun, they're not vertical like grasses, you need something like three to five leaf area units per land area unit to maximize growth rate. Leaf area index, three to five. Alfalfa, they're a little more vertical. You want five or six leaf area units per land area unit. So five or six square inches of alfalfa leaf area per square inch of soil. Grasses that are more upright goes up to seven or 10. But these kinds of numbers are actually things you can calibrate your eye to. You can go out and look at a pasture and say, oh, I think I got three or four times more leaf area than I do land area. That tells me my pastures are probably growing at about a maximum rate. And I kind of want to maintain them in that, that range. And that's what phase two is. Um, so one approach that people, at, at least in other countries in the world, use is they actually calibrate their eye to leaf area index. And they try to maximize the land area on their farm that's at these appropriate or what are called optimum or critical leaf area indexes. Okay, so here's another way to think about it. This is that Daryl Emmett's book again. So he's looking at forage height and inches, pre-grazing, pre-grazing, pre-grazing in all cases. But he's gone through two or three grazing cycles, or rotational grazing, let things regrow. And what he's found is the first time he grazed a little harder, a little closer to the soil surface. Second time, he was a little more relaxed about it. He didn't rotate the animals through uh, in, in such a way that they took off as much. And the third time, he left even more. And we're going to con contrast this with a different condition here on the next slide. But what Daryl did here was he allowed that residual forage mass or leaf area to kind of build up as he went through the season, thinking that would be a good thing as far as capturing sunlight energy. Makes sense. Well, the trade-off there is you're also allowing the leftover dead material that happens to be part of this kind of build up. And over time, these residual forage canopies actually get more and more dead tissue in them. And so that's something we've got to think about on the other end of the spectrum. So here's an alternative is if you try to graze down after phase two, you try to graze back down to roughly the same level or same mass of post-grazing residual. You're probably going to have less buildup of that dry ground senescent tissue in, in your successive uh, 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 crops and probably have a higher quality, more productive pasture. Okay, so all this kind of background information leads to these typical recommendations you see from Extension and NRCS and Soil and Water Conservation Districts, depending on the species and the season and the weather conditions and so on. Pasture growth rates can be anywhere from uh, slow <coughs> in April to fast in late May, early June, to very slow in July and August, uh, to medium in the fall. and so. Therefore, we wind up with these very different numbers for days of recovery or, or regrowth period. They can be as, as little as two weeks to as much as 45 to 60 days. 
One more way to think about appropriate grazing stages besides solar energy capture is the physiology of the plants is such that when many of our cool season perennial grasses, ryegrass, orchard grass, fall fescue, let's just focus on those for the moment. It turns out that when many of those grasses are in what we call the three leaf to four leaf stage, that means three or four fully elongated leaves on a stem or on a tiller. Um, what we find out is pasture growth rate has been very high. They've been in phase two. Forage quality is still very high, high energy. Plant is in positive energy balance. It's capturing about 95% of sunlight energy that's falling on that canopy. Roots and shoots regrow rapidly following the foliation because the, the, the plant has the, the reserves to send down to the root system. So that's another very simple way if you don't want to get bogged down with numbers of days and all these prescriptions and lists, you can just go out and read the plants. Are they in three leaf stage, four leaf stage, five leaf stage? If so, I'll be ready to graze. Okay, now I've got to bring the animal into this um, and uh, now talk about all these um, trade offs. So, with raising animals on pasture, the, the biggest constraint to animal performance, the individual animal performance, is not the quality or composition of the pasture. It's the quantity that they can get in a single bite. If you think about an animal taking 30 to 40,000 bites in a day, doing all that work, they need each bite to be as big as it can be. It needs to be the size of a baseball or a softball, not the size of a marble or a golf ball, right? If they're taking 40,000 bites and they're all little tiny scavenging bites, they're not gonna get the kind of intake they need to meet their genetic potential. So we've got to be thinking about quantity. Uh, and, and this just shows it. amount of forage in a bite times the rate at which they bite times the number of hours they graze gives you total daily intake. Okay, and, and if you had to it down, it's the size of the individual bite. You can simulate that with your hand just going out in the pasture. Is that a big bite or is that a, a, a little scavenging bite? If you think about those things, you can predict how well your animals are going to do on high quality pasture. So let's just look at a few conditions here from our pastures in Reedsville. And let's contrast some of these conditions. Do uh, you see anything here where quantity might be limiting to intake? Maybe? Very seldom. They're probably going to be able to get enough to eat in any of these three conditions. Okay. What about quality? If now, now, now that we've met the quantity requirement and they can get large enough bites, they might be a little bit limited here. Um, this might be more like ideal, but this isn't bad. So now we can think about quality once they're getting enough quantity. Which one is going to maybe limit performance because of lower quality? Yeah, this guy. Okay, fiber. Digestibility are down. The quantity is tremendous, but we let it get too far. Okay. So this is probably where the, these two conditions are where they're going to be doing best in terms of average daily gain. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. So go ahead. Going back to that last question. Yeah. If you get into that in the spring, are you better off just trim it? Oh, that's a great question. Yeah. Should we trim it and drop it? Um, and so I always ask myself, what's that going to cost me? kind of like dragging manure. What's it going to cost me to, to run the machinery, the labor? And I don't honestly know the correct answer. I, I don't think it's a bad thing to, to, to brush hog it and drop it. You're not wasting anything because you'll recycle the nutrients. You just have to make sure that you're not spending too much time and money doing that. Uh, as long as you've got an economic justification, then I think it's a good thing to do. Yeah, because it'll stimulate regrowth. It'll open the canopy back up to sunlight. You get high quality regrowth, and this isn't wasted. You just think of it as nutrients that you're putting back on the soil. But it's expensive to do, so just make sure you can really afford to do it. Um, last year they had a fall, and he was here. He put his cattle in moved to move regularly. Yeah. But uh, he overstocked it in, in a kind of a sense and let him trample. Yes. Down. Sure. So that it deteriorates faster. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's another strategy. If you want to just reincorporate, and, and so the strategy there, I'm glad you brought that up. The strategy there would be 
let's let them selectively graze the highest quality parts of that canopy, the leaves, the, uh, um, the, the, the most digestible parts. Let's not worry so much about the fiber and the stems. That material can be trampled in uh, by the cattle. So they can still get high quality as long as we're not pushing them to consume it all. So as long as we let them trample that in the intro. That's a good point, thank you. Okay, so here's the, the, the most important graph that should lead us to deciding well, what's this optimum intensity of production that we need to decide about. So if you think about grazing pressure or stocking rate going from levels of few animals per acre, few animals uh, competing for an amount of forage, <coughs> to high stocking rate or lots of animals competing for the forage. Um, and then you look at gain per animal, gain per day, this is in kilograms, so it will turn into pounds, that'd be 2.2 2 pounds average daily gain. Or gain per acre, this is in kilograms per hectare, but that's more or less the same as pounds per acre. So we might be up at 800, 900 pounds per acre. What happens if, if we're stocked at a low stocking rate, lots of forage per animal, large intakes, Animals can perform at their genetic potential, which is which is the maximum average they could gain. So here they are. As we add animals, that's going to maintain itself for a while until intakes start to become limiting. And as intakes become limiting, individual animal performance, of course, is going to drop off, and it's finally going to go all the way to maintenance, or even lower. If you really push it hard, it'll go negative. Okay. We all understand that function. Now what about, as you add animals, what happens to gain per acre? Well, obviously gain per acre goes up for a while, because each animal you add is at a high level of performance. But what happens over here as animal performance is coming down, 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 but we're still adding the animals to that acre, well, we peak, maximum gain per acre, and then it also drops off. You know, we're just maintaining an awful lot of animals that are, that are just cycling in place and going nowhere. And so the whole point of this graph, and I can't give you numbers that are specific to your farm, but the whole point is maximum individual animal performance is at a lower stocking rate, fewer animals per acre. Maximum gain per acre <laughs> is at a higher stocking rate. A lot of people intuitively assume that's going to make them the most money, and it doesn't. The place where you make the most money is some area in between these two things, and it's hard to, to put a number on it. But you do not make the most money at maximizing gain per acre. Counterintuitive, but dozens of studies have shown that. So you need to think about dropping back and maximizing gain per acre. The other thing maximizing gain per acre does to you is it puts you in the highest possible risk for not being prepared to go through a drought or a pest cycle or, or, or some other factor that you don't really want to have to deal with if you have an awful lot of animals out there on the landscape. Now, let's just talk about a few actual techniques and methods. Again, I don't think they're as important as all the other stuff we've talked about earlier, but obviously we're all familiar with continuous stocking or continuous grazing as a way to allocate forage to animals. We're familiar with rotational grazing where we move animals through a series of paddocks or subdivisions. Here's what a lot of us do with uh, called buffer grazing where maybe we'll continue continuous grazing, but we'll put up a temporary fence partway through the spring and we'll, we'll allocate off some of this that we're going to harvest mechanically for hay or silage. And that kind of keeps the pasture in balance with the animal numbers. If we reduce the land area, even though the pasture the plants were growing rapidly, we kind of fixed that, that problem. We set aside some land area here, we harvested a crop, and then we take the fence out. And you can open the whole area back up for grazing when plants are growing more slowly in that second half of the summer. So it's a way to balance supply and demand, even though you're still just continuously grazing. Um, 
strip raising, we, it's really the same concept as rotational raising, except in strip raising, we don't expect to come back to that same forage during the growing season. So strip raising is something we tend to do on dormant forage, like, like fall stockpile, winter grazed forage. We use it all up, and then we move to the next one, we move to the next one, we move to the next one. We don't expect it to regrow, unless we're talking about next spring or summer. Creek grazing, we can put in some sort of a gate, let smaller animals with higher nutritional requirements creep through, get specialized forage on something we manage to be higher quality. We can restrict the intake of the mothers. They don't need as much. And so it's a way to allocate forage efficiently to two different animal classes to meet their requirements. Kind of an extension of that is leader follower or first uh, last grazing, where we'll actually send a group of animals with higher requirements through, let them use up a third, maybe half of the paddock, move them on to the next and the next and the next and follow with a group with lower requirements. It sounds great, it's fun to try, it's very complicated. How many of you are successful at it? It's, it's, it's hard to do. You have to be good. You have to be really good at it. Um, but it's an interesting idea. Um, mixed grazing, sequence grazing, frontal grazing. Let's look at a couple of pictures here. Dr. Bird. Yes. Five minutes. Okay. Let's just look at overall efficiency of utilization. If we're continuously stocked or continuously grazing, we're probably using about a third of the total forage dry matter we grow per season. About a third of that's going through animals. If we start going to these more um, uh, uh, rotational forms, we start adding subdivisions uh, up to six or eight, maybe maybe even ten. Uh, we're starting to get into fifty, possibly sixty percent utilization of that same forage. So we can easily double forage utilization by animals as we go continuous. <coughs> rotational stocking. That's, that's, that's been shown time and again. Daryl Emick shows it here in one of his slides. He's looking at pasture yields from continuously stocked, four paddock rotation, 16 paddock rotation systems in New York. And what he finds is the 16 paddock rotation, 7,400 pounds forage dry matter per acre, gave him about the same amount he was getting from hay length of a similar nature. We all know about the, the, the challenges and difficulties of continuous grazing where animals will select and we've got this patch overgrazing mixed in with patch undergrazing. That's a challenge with continuous stocking. Uh, it's one reason a lot of people go to rotational stocking. Uh, I'm not going to bother with the data here. Uh, I'm going to jump to this summary instead. Back to the seed summary, and I'll try to finish up here in a couple minutes. When they looked at the research literature comparing continuous versus rotational to grazing or stocking, um, and they studied about 30 papers that they thought were legitimate, valid tests of rotational versus continuous stocking, what they found is, if you look at all 29 of the studies, in most cases, this is average daily gain, individual animal performance. In most cases, which this middle bar, there's actually no difference in individual animal performance between rotational and grazed and, and continuously grazed animals, if both are done well. Okay? In a few cases, there's a little bit of an advantage, believe it or not, for continuously grazed animals. If there is a difference, the advantage for individual animal performance is for continuous stocking. That's kind of interesting. Now, what about gain per acre? Okay, if there's no great advantage in terms of individual animal performance, I just told you a couple, three slides ago, we can carry more animals because we're using the forage more efficiently. And sure enough, what they found is in many cases, actually in the majority of cases, they found no difference, but in the cases where there was a difference, it was always in favor of the rotation of the stock system. There was always more carrying capacity or forage utilization from rotationally grazed than continuously grazed. Example of the <coughs> gate where you can let animals through to high quality pastures. Here's an example of leader 
follower. So we've got yearlings here. They're advancing this way, followed by their mothers. So the mothers are getting the second half of the residue that the, the, the stalkers left behind. So the stalkers are getting the, the high diet selection, the high quality, the high intake. That's where we want to allocate our resources. And we're sticking the mothers, the poor moms, with the, the, the lower quality goods. And again, some numbers, I don't think I should take time on that. Um, I'm, I'm just going to finish with one or two points on stockpiling, because I, I have to stop in about a minute. So if we, if we talk about fall, late summer, and fall stockpiling for winter grazing, um, two or three considerations. One is we really do have to do a good job with summer management in order for those plants to be in positive enough energy balance in August and September that they'll grow and respond and, and, and give us the 2,500 to 3,000 pounds of forest dry matter we need so that we can be grazing in November, December, and maybe January. Um, if we don't do a good job in the summer, the pastures aren't going to regrow very well in the fall. The other thing I want to mention is if some of our pastures go to higher and higher legumes, it's actually harder to stockpile that material because legumes tend to, to um, dry out and shatter and, and, and leaves fall off when you get into these frosts in November and you don't you, you, you grew a lot of forage during late summer and fall, but a lot of it falls on the ground. So grasses, particularly tall fescue, are pretty well suited to fall stockpiling. Legumes, not as much. Any other uh, major points here? Um, well, of course, if, if we're in the dry summer periods, then even if we get good grazing management during the summer, uh, dry, dry soils are going to limit the extent to which we can stop plants. Uh, allocate enough land area and time to grow 2,000 to 4,000 pounds of dry matter per acre during August and September. Apply nitrogen if it's a high grass system early in the stockpiling period for grass response. Fence reutilization within a three to seven day period to minimize waste and ice sheeting as we're strict grazing off that resource. Graze more delicate and less weather tolerant forage is first. So if you have a high legume patch or if you have forage that you think is going to lodge over in snow, graze that first and leave the more robust, upright, tougher plants like tall fescue for later in the winter. Um, I think that's about my ending point, and um, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions if we've got it. Appreciate your patience. I know that was a lot of material. Is that Mike? I can't see very well, but... Uh, you got a question about the phase two? Yeah. 